everyone, and welcome to the Women and Girls in Astronomy Project from the International Astronomical Union. I am Dr. Sharon Hack, an astronomer at the University of the West Indies and the National Outreach Coordinator in Trinidad and Tobago for the International Astronomical Union. Today, I am really excited for our very special guest, Professor Joycelyn Bell Burnell, who is part of the Women and Girls in Astronomy Project with the International Astronomical Union. So the IAU celebrated Women and Girls in Astronomy on February 11, 2019. And they did this in addition to commemorating Women and Girls in Astronomy Day and in tandem with the United Nations International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And as a legacy of this project that was started in 2019, we are now celebrating Women and Girls in Astronomy project. And it's not just a one day affair, it extends from February 11 and aptly ends on March 8, which is the International Day of Women um, 2021 this year. So it's my absolute pleasure today to introduce our guest, Professor Joycelyn Bell Burnell. Professor Joycelyn Bell Burnell is an astrophysicist from Northern Ireland. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of Glasgow. She began work on her PhD at Cambridge University. And as a postgraduate student, she discovered the first radio pulsars in 1967. She discovered radio pulsars alongside her advisor, Anthony Hewish. Bell Burnell served as president of the Royal Astronomical Society from 2002 to 2004. <laughs> and as president of the Institute of Physics from October 2008 until October 2010, and as an interim president of the Institute in early 2011. In 2018, she was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. She decided to give the prize money to help women, minority groups, and refugee students who aspire to become physics researchers. Moreover, the funds were administered by the Institute of Physics. She has earned countless awards and honors for her contributions to science. So it is such an honor to have you with us today, Professor, and I'm really looking forward to our interview. So welcome, Professor. All right, so shall we get... Okay, so let's get started. So I've got a couple of questions for you. And let's get started with the fundamentals. Why, in your opinion, is gender equality important? It's been shown by management consultants, a firm called McKinsey's based largely in the USA, but also a bit in Europe, that the most successful groups, be it in business or research, are the most diverse. They're hardest to manage. The easiest group to manage is a group of people just like you, but that turns out to be less successful, less flexible and less robust. So I see it as important that there are more women and girls in astronomy to improve the gender balance. All right. So in your, how do you see that? What is the richness or well as diversity that women can bring? into the field of astronomy. They currently are a minority. Uh, I myself, as a, I'm the only professional astronomer in the Caribbean region, that's to tell you how yes. challenging it is on our end of the world. How, how yes. can women enrich this field? By, just by being women with slightly different backgrounds, maybe slightly different ways of thinking, um, different priorities. All these things will make people approach a question in a slightly different way. And that's what can be so fruitful. Okay, that def definitely lends to a richness of ideas. And in your career and journey in astronomy, did you experience any barriers as a woman in your area? A lot, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm now in my late 70s. So this is going back a bit, but when I was a child, um, we all had to sit an exam at age 11. It was believed that they could tell at that stage whether a child was going to be academic 
or more practical and needing a technical education. The snag is at that age, girls tend to be brighter than boys because they have matured a bit more quickly. And too many girls were passing that exam and keeping boys out of the um, academic education stream. So where I lived and in a number of other places in Britain, they had a higher pass mark for girls so that the girls weren't blocking the boys. Wow. And it goes on and on and on. I have many, many stories, but it's, that's the first one. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, as you mentioned that, I mean, I mentioned the situation in the Caribbean, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we actually still have that exam that the children um, take at age 11. And it is extremely stressful for children at that age. And, um, but that has not been introduced as yet, <laughs> um, where there's a difference between say the pass mark for boys and girls. <laughs> I'm really shocked to learn of um, um, that kind of imbalance that it would, they would have had. So um, growing up, did you have any defining moments in your childhood or as a teen that made you think, yes, this is it's astronomy that I wanted to do? As soon as we started doing science at school, which we started at about age 12, uh, it was clear I was good at physics, okay at chemistry, and really rather bored by what they were teaching us in biology. I came top of the physics class, in fact, having had a fight to get into the class, because at that time in my country, girls learned cookery and needlework and boys did science. And I wanted to do science. My parents wanted me to do science. So we had a fight to get me into the class, but uh, I got into the class along with two other girls. I think we were the first girls ever to do science. And at the end of that first term, I came top in physics. Wow, that's fantastic. So I, I liked physics, I could do it. Uh, a lot of people couldn't. <laughs> and as I went through my teens, I was wondering, okay, I'll probably go to university. I'll do a physics degree. What will I do after that? And I became interested in astronomy. And then realized that to do optical astronomy, you have to be able to stay up at night. And I like my sleep, I like my bed. And then I got to hear of radio astronomy. And what converted me to astronomy was reading a book by Fred Hoyle called Frontiers of Astronomy. And at school, we were learning about circular motion, you know, things going around in a circle. And in this book, Fred Hoyle is talking about galaxies rotating. Ah, right. I'll be an astrophysicist and astronomer. All right. So, so the influence of the um, things that you were reading and um, bringing it to the forefront. So in your career in astronomy, and as you said, you did experience some um, gender biases. How do you overcome it? What's the kind of advice you will give to perhaps women in astronomy and sciences that are listening to us today? How do you handle this kind of challenge? Um, you often just have to get on with, you know, whatever needs to be done and kind of ignore some of the discrimination uh, because you can't fight everything. Choose what things you challenge, choose your fights carefully uh, and get some allies if you can. Now, for me, I was the only woman in the place quite often, so I didn't really have many allies. Um, above all, you've got to do really excellent work if you're one of very few women, because if you don't do excellent work, the men will say, oh, trust a woman to do poor work. So you're under quite a bit of pressure from that as well. But we can do it, we can rise to it. Yes, and that's exactly the kind of message we need, do need to hear. Um, as you look back over the decades, um, do you think the situation has improved for women in astronomy? It certainly has in Britain and in quite a lot of the English-speaking world. Um, 
The IAU itself now collects its membership data segregated by gender. And so there's lots of interesting information on women astronomers who belong to the IAU. And the largest number of women is towards the younger end, um, around about 30, probably 30, 40, 20, 30, 40. Uh, the largest number of men is about 50 or 60. So there's been big efforts to bring in more women. And of course, they've been bringing in younger women. So that's reflected in the, the IAU data. But it's very good that for probably about 20 years now, the IAU has collected its membership data segregated by gender. Admittedly, only two genders, male and female. And we have to be more nuanced now, but it was a good start. Yeah, so good to see that it's moving in a positive direction. And even with the IAU now, we are seeing so much growth in um, diversity and inclusion. So it's good that we are moving in the correct direction. All right, um, I am actually a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. And there's a course that I designed that I teach called History of Science. So there's a segment in it, Women in Science. and, and apart from as well as teaching astrophysics. So I can tell you, Professor, you always come up in my, so especially when I'm teaching the women in science and I, uh, we talk about the discovery of the pulsars, the role that you played in it. And as I go on to mention that the Nobel Prize was um, received in part by your um, supervisor, the students in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean are in uproar. And I actually see it quite positive that the boys and girls equally, and I've always <laughs> wondered how did that experience mold you and you know the perceived role of women in astronomy? Well, there was a positive side to that Nobel Prize. It was, you may remember, a Nobel Prize in physics. Yes. There is no Nobel Prize in astronomy or astrophysics. It just doesn't exist. And this was the first time that the physics committee had allocated the prize to somebody in astrophysics. And that was a huge precedent, a huge step. And I knew instantly that many other astrophysicists would get that Nobel Physics Prize. And indeed, a fair number of astrophysicists have. So what was really important about that Nobel Prize was that the, for the first time, the physics committee considered astrophysics as good physics. Um, there was quite a bit of uproar in Britain. The word Nobel became no hyphen bell because I was Jocelyn Bell at that stage. So it became uh -huh. right. no bell prize. <laughs> Um, it was my contemporaries who were, I think, most outraged, most furious. Um, but the Nobel Prize does not often go to students. Very, very, very rarely. So. Right. It's an important learning um, historical uh, experience for the rest of us. And, and I can tell you that outrage continues to this time and right across the world. So I... I, for one, was so excited when I saw that you received the Breakthrough Prize in mm -hmm. Physics. Congratulations, well-deserved, Professor. All right, so as we continue on the issue of gender discrimination and so on, so uh, working in astronomy, are there, um, did, do you generally feel um, that there was gender discrimination to becoming an astronomer um, generally and during the time that you worked as an astronomer? that sense of gender discrimination? Yes, and I think partly it, it was historical. Um, during the 1939-1945 war, I was born during that war. During that war, the men went to fight and the women came out of the home and did a number of the jobs that the men did normally. And they did them very well. And after the war, it was felt that women should go back into the home, raise children, look after their husbands, and the husbands would go out and do the work, have the careers. 
that's gradually changed with time. But for quite a lot of my career, that was the normal thinking. Um, so, for example, when I had my first lecturing job in the University of Southampton, on the lecture, sh lecture schedule, all the men were professor or doctor. But the secretaries felt that I should be Mrs, not doctor. Wow, wow. Those things send huge messages, yes. huge messages. <laughs> And yeah. uh, I mean, as we were all talking about, um, you'll be surprised. Um, my name is Shirin. So sometimes across the world, it's not recognized immediately. And I would send an email out work related to someone who doesn't know me and they will reply, um, Mr. Hack, <laughs> we are pleased to hear from you. <laughs> so it's just sort of assumed. Um, and I'm sharing some of my own stories as we are chatting yes. as well. And um, I was doing my um, astronomy at the at the University of Virginia at the time. And I was there with my family and um, husband. And if we went anywhere, everyone assumed that he was the person who was studying the astronomy and not myself. <laughs> so mm -hmm. even at this era, these small messages are um, troubling to our young ladies. So with that, and these are the subliminal messages that go out, and I would like to ask you, Professor, um, how do you, how important do you see the role of female mentorship to our young girls in, um, in the schooling system? I think there should be good mentorship. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and increasingly, there are very good men around who make excellent mentors. So I don't want to say that only women should do it. Women carry quite big burdens as it is because there are few women. Um, so I don't particularly want to add to their burdens, but I think there should be mentorship and it should be done by sensitive people, male or female. Um, it's useful if there are some women around so that the girls can see that women do do astronomy. Women are professors of physics and things like that. But I'm not sure that all the mentorship has to be done by women. All right. Yeah, so mentorship is important, good mentorship. So that's an important message to get out there to our people. And um, what about one piece of advice for the girl who's trying to study astronomy? And, and I, well, I mean, I build in my own little experiences in our little conversation here. I was actually told, given the region that I was in, which is the Caribbean, that you're not going to get a job in astronomy. Um, you know, there are no careers for women in these fields. And well, nonetheless, I was lucky. But so what is the one piece of advice that you would give for the girl who's trying to study astronomy? Uh, what would it be? It would be to hang in there. Keep at it. Don't give up. Uh, it's a great subject to study. Uh, lots and lots of exciting and interesting things happening all the time. The subject changes ever so fast. <laughs> so I, I would say, keep in there. You're going, whatever you do, being persistent is important. And it will be important here as well. So if that's what you want to do, Go ahead and do it. All right, and that is well noted, absolutely very important piece of advice. So Professor, one of the things, well, in when I introduced you, um, we noted that you served as president of the Royal Astronomical Society and in leadership positions. Um, what can we do to encourage positive changes in relationship to the low representation of women in decision-making roles in astronomy? And we have that same situation. So these things are not unique, even in the Caribbean, while interestingly, in the Caribbean, women and girls do are quite well represented at the lower levels in science. But what we see is as you go up higher in ma management, there is a reduction. So what do you think we can do to encourage positive changes for um, improving the representation and decision-making roles in astronomy? I think the ultimate best way to do it is to get the funding bodies to take an interest. 
So who pays for university salaries in your country? Who pays the costs of research in your country? Um, if the, the bodies that provide those money can see the value of having women in all sorts of positions, then they can put pressure on universities, observatories to improve their gender balance. And that's ultimately the way to make it happen. So you have to convince the funding bodies, the, the people that provide the money, that gender balance is a good idea. Okay, so that's, um, thank you very much for that note. And so there's a lot of work cut out for all of us and all the young women out there in astronomy to ensure um, that there is gender equality all around. So we'll be coming close to the end of our interview. And um, I wanna ask you one brief, a uh, message to girls, a message that you can send out to girls in general who are interested in astronomy. I find astronomy to be huge fun and a fantastic job all the way through my life. There's a lot of excitement in astronomy these days with a lot of discoveries being made. So if you're good at physics, maths, computing, or if you're a good instrument builder, making equipment. Um, in all those areas, there's huge need for astronomers and opportunities for women as much as men. So if you like it, go for it. Good luck. Okay, that's an excellent point there, right? So girls out there, go for it. And you heard it right here from Professor Joycelyn Belbernell. Now, Professor, at this point, I want to share something with you. Uh, when I was doing my uh, PhD at University of Virginia, I don't know if you will remember this, um, you gave the Carl Jangsi 30th lecture and it was called uh, Tick, 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 Pulsating Star, How We Wonder What You Are. What? Yes, what you are. This professor was in 1995. And when I returned from University of Virginia back to my home in Trinidad and Tobago, I think I did not even bring all my texts and notes back, but I brought back this poster. And it's been in my office on my notice board for 25 years. That's to tell you the kind of inspiration unknown to you to this person sitting in the audience that day the kind of impact it had to see you and what you had um, achieved not just for astrophysics the amazing work in astrophysics but as a role model to all the women out there all right so i just wanted to share that with you so we're going to be okay so we're going to be wrapping up. Would you like any last words that you would like to share with us on our um, uh, Women and Girls in Astronomy project with the International Astronomical Union? I'm very glad that there is such a project in the IAU. It says a lot about the IAU that it now has a project on women and girls. And that of itself is very encouraging. Things are changing quite fast. And of course, the IAU has had its first women president and first woman secretary. Um, they're both coming near the end of their terms, but they've been great. So things undoubtedly are moving and about time too. <laughs> okay. So I think we can safely say that the future of astronomy is looking bright. And for all the girls out there who are who is listening to um, the words from Professor Joycelyn Bell Burnell, there's definitely a future and we need all of you as part of this um, project and initiative of getting more girls into astronomy. So Professor, thank you so much for taking the time out to share your thoughts with us on this project. And it has been an absolute delight to have you today. Thank you very much, Professor Joycelyn Bell Burnell. Thank you, Shirin. Thank you very much.